Jacob, all in Jesus' mighty name, all glory to the Father in the mighty name of Jesus. I hope everybody had a good, not only just Passover, but Feast of Unleavened Bread week. I know I did. I had a great time at uh, two places. I tried to make four, but one I had to cancel because today they're going to have snow. That's Brother Rodney Russell up in uh, Zion with uh, church, Israel, the Church of the Living God. Um, but Thursday night, went to House of Jacob. Just want to say everybody there, peace in the mighty name of Jesus. My daughter told me to cut my notifications down, and I didn't. And now I'm getting notifications. <sighs> Show you the type of father I am. I don't listen to my children. Right. Yeah, I'm a bad parent. But... Um, yeah, so I was going to go up there. Um, uh, shouts out to uh, Brother, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Elijah Israel with Israel Church of Jesus. He met me and some of the brothers over Brother Danny's uh, church, House of, Is uh, House of Jacob, that has moved on 75th. For those that don't know, they, they're in the old IOG building, praise the Lord. And then last night, or yesterday, I was at home at uh, the Israel of God. And it was wonderful. Food was excellent. I don't care what people say. That feast was great. And then the singing afterwards. And if you want to see some of the singing that the band and some of the choir members were doing, you can go right on my page. There's like eight parts. All right. Some beautiful praising of the Lord. And so, with all that same being said, I just, again, hope everybody had a good feast of unleavened bread and Passover. And Pentecost should be coming in about a month, right? About a month and a half. Same thing. And as y'all saw me with all my hashtags, no camp banging. We all one body. We all one spirit, one mind. And we all following one law. All right, that Christ told us to, to follow. 
Let me take these off because they shining. So, with that being said, let's get into opening up. Uh, let's all go to Isaiah 28. And let's start reading. Isaiah 28. And we're going to start reading at verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Who is the he? He is the Lord. Let me do a little bit more adjusting. He is the Lord, okay? He's the one teaching the nation of Israel, who he said would be a kingdom of priests. And as Jesus said when he came in the flesh, he sent them kingdom of priests to go out and teach the rest of the world. Let's uh, keep on reading. For precept must be upon precept. Precept must be upon precept when we're learning and when we're teaching. All right? Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. So you could go through the book. You can read this book like a novel if you want to. But the Lord put this book in such a way where you, you have a message here. And you have a message here, and oh, you can put it together. For example, when we teach about how Israel was black, okay, we could go to Jacob. It doesn't say that he was black, does it? Say he came out all smooth. These are people that know what I'm talking about. Say he came out smooth. He wasn't hairy like his brother. But when we look at the descendants, and we get to Joseph, we know that Joseph was black. Because his brothers, if he was white, his brothers would have said, why is Joseph sitting up there if the, if the Israelites were white? You see what I'm saying? So from the message we got from Joseph being black, we know that Jacob was black. That's precept on precept. Here a little, there a little. This is how the Lord puts things together for you to figure out, to use your brain. Let's keep going. Uh, uh, verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. So when he spoke to Israel in these days, he's doing it with other languages and other tongues. So there's nothing wrong with Hebrew. But he said he was going to speak to us in different languages of the tongues. Why? Because we chose the route of slavery. All right. Remember, Christ told us to go out to all nations and teach. Right. Right. So we had an option to do that ourselves, but because we kept rebelling, we ended up going to slavery and doing it anyway. And I do it in the English, all right? He said he would speak to this people in another tongue. So he's speaking to Israel in different languages. And in Israel's job, in those languages, go out and teach the rest of the world. Let's go to Isaiah 8. So when Israel goes out to teach to the rest of the world, like Christ commanded us to, how are we supposed to do it? Isaiah 8 verse 20 to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word is because there is no light in them so if they're going to speak to the law they got to use the Old Testament and the testimony the gospels and the epistles of Paul all right and Peter and John they got to read the New Testament too because if they don't, it says there's no light in them. So if they're only going to read the Old Testament and not the New, there's no light. They're only going to do the New and not the Old, there's no light. To the law and the testimony. All right. Let's uh, go to Revelation 14 and see who actually listened to the law and the testimony that the Lord showed his people to teach the rest of the world. Revelation. 14 and 12. One verse. Revelation 14 and 12. Why well, keep going to 12 all the time? 14 and 12. Here are the patience of the saints. Remember, these are the saints that's going to go marching in and you want to be in that number? Well, here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So they kept the law and the testimony because they left, they kept the commandments of God, which is the law, and then they had the faith of Jesus, which was the New Testament, which is the testimony. And in the testimony, the Lord tells us in Matthew 19, verse 17, to keep the commandments. It's that simple. 
It is that simple. Satan has made everything out here so complicated that people just their mindset will not understand this. Three scriptures just, just show everything. <laughs> Three matter of fact, let's chop it off with four scriptures. Let's go to the end of the book. Revelation 22 and verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Oh. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So if you're keeping the commandments, you get to get into the city and have a right to the tree of life. But if you don't keep the commandments, what happens? Verse 15. <clears throat> for thou, for without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So that's people that broke the law. So, anyone telling you, you don't have to keep that old law or them commandments, is a liar. The truth ain't in them. And that's what we're going to read about today. That's what the name of this this title of this lesson is, if the law's done away with, why did the original Christians do certain things? This is a message to people that call themselves Christians and deal with modern day Christianity. So share this video, people. Share the video. Like it, share it. Again, also subscribe to my YouTube channel because I can't go live on there till I get over a thousand subscribers on my phone. All right. But this is a lesson that does need to be shared because there's too many people. Too many of our loved ones, Israel, are thinking that they don't have to keep any law, no, any commandments. At all. Yet they're keeping a whole bunch that man made up. <laughs> okay. So let's go to Acts. We're going to start reading. Why did the early Christians. And then we're going to see who the Christians were. Why were they still keeping the law. If the law was done away with. So that's the name of the title of this lesson. Uh, thank you for everybody that's coming in. Like I said. Please share. I see people coming in. Hey, Sister Denise. Hey, Sister uh, uh, Renee. I see you guys. I would scroll, but I'm afraid I'm going to mess around and cut the, the, the live feed off. All right. So let's go. Um, let's start in Acts 1. All right. Now, what we're going to read here is the very beginning <coughs> of apostles. And again, excuse me for my allergies. You know, and spring coming, so they're going to get worse. So let's start reading at verse 1. Acts 1, verse 1. The former treaties I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments, Unto the apostles whom he had chosen. What were those commandments that he was given? The old commandments. Jesus didn't come up with any new commandments. When he came up with the two commandments, and I have a lesson on that you could go check out, he was quoting the old commandments from the very beginning that he actually gave to Moses. People like to say, you know, that's the law of Moses, like Moses made it up himself. No, law came from God. Verse 3, to whom he has showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them and they that they should not depart from Jerusalem. He, now, he even told them, don't leave yet. There's a reason why he didn't want them to leave. Let's keep reading. But wait for the promise of the Father, which he which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. 
So he's telling them the Holy Spirit going to come down and baptize you in some days. He didn't give them a day yet. He didn't tell them what day. He's telling them, stay in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit going to come and baptize you. All right. Verse six, when the, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the outermost part of the earth. So here's Christ now. He's telling them to stay in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit's going to come, baptize you, and then you're going to be my witnesses, not just here in Jerusalem, not just in, uh, in Judea and Samaria, but where? And unto the uttermost part of the earth, all around the globe all over the place. That's what our job was to do. But we chose to do it through slavery. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. Then returned they to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they were come in, they went up to Jer in, up, in the upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Alphaeus and Simon, Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. All right. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. It's the brothers and the sisters. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. Now, let's go to Acts 2. Because they're in the upper room. Right? That's where they're at. In the upper room. Now, let's go to Acts 2 and start reading in verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, the day of Pentecost is called something else. It's called the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is in the law. The Lord told them to go to Jerusalem and wait, right? But he didn't tell them what day this thing was going to happen. So Israel was coming to Jerusalem. All of Israel was coming to Jerusalem for Pentecost anyway why because the law said to do this this was not well we're going to go there and on pentecost we're going to tarry for the holy ghost and we're going to be like come on till the holy ghost come verse two and suddenly there came a sound from the heaven as a rushing mighty wind and it filled the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. So now there's these cloven tongues that sat upon each of these apostles and all these brothers that was in there. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Not babbling. Other tongues. Remember what we read in uh, Isaiah 28? I'm going to speak to you in other languages, in other tongues. And there appeared unto them, and, uh, I'm sorry, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit is getting all of these people to understand each other. Because when they all came, they were diff from different places and spoke different languages. But now they all understanding each other. Let's keep reading. Verse 5, and there dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. All of these was only Israelites. But they spoke other languages. 
because the disbursement was happening before 70 AD. Let's keep reading. Now, we went into captivity a whole bunch of times before 70 AD happened. Verse 6. Now, when this was no, when this no, I'm sorry. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were hearing other people that they knew spoke another language in his language because that's the spirit was giving them utterance, right? The spirit was sitting there and all them tongues were translating. The best way to, to, to describe is that the United Nations, they all do the same thing. When they all come together, everybody speak different languages, but everybody got interpreters to tell them what another, what another person is saying in their language. This wasn't something, oh, uh, we just going, how about a shit me and shit about a Honda. That, no, that's not what this whole thing was about. But there's a doctrine that says that what's going on here is that you, I mean, listen, man. When I was a shorty in a Baptist church, they put you in a room, another upper room. They put you in a room and I forgot what it is they wanted you to say. It was something, it had something to do with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but it was something they wanted you to say and they wanted you to say it over and over and over and repeat it and say it quicker and faster and faster till you keep saying it. Next thing you know, you're going, and next thing you know, they're saying, oh, you got the Holy Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit now because you're sitting up here, blah, 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 because they're telling you to say it quicker, say it quicker, say it quicker, say it quicker, say it quicker. And then you saying it so fast, you're not pronouncing what they told you to say, right? So now that's where this came from, from Acts 2. That's what this came from. And when, when, they was, when they was doing this to me as a child, I was just like, okay. You know, same thing when I got baptized. Hey, I'm just doing it because everybody else doing it. Had no idea what was trying to be put on me, right? But that's where this whole thing about speaking in tongues came from. But the understanding of speaking in tongues is not what it is today. Speaking in tongues is literally the same thing it was back then. Understanding other languages and speaking other languages. That's speaking in tongues, not speaking something that only you and God can hear. That don't make sense. Why would God do something like that when he wants you to go out and teach the rest of the world? But if you only speaking in this in, in this Babylon tongue, who going to understand you? But that's another lesson. Let's not, let me not get into that one. Uh, verse 36. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus. Now, this is Peter. He's, he's sitting up here talking, right? He's speaking to everybody that's there. You can read the rest of the chapter on your own. I, I got to skip verses because I got a lot of stuff here. That God hath made same Jesus that we which ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. Oh, that's the very same thing Christ started off with, with his ministry. The very same thing. Peter's saying the same thing. Then Peter said unto him, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that offer off, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward or perverse generation.
But why were they all there? Why were these followers of Christ, which we call, which we say Christians today, followers of Christ, why were these Christians there? Let's go to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. If the law is done away with, why were Christians doing certain things after Christ died? Especially after we see right here is where, you know, people want to say, well, you know, the, the church started and stuff. Now, if the church started by keeping the law, shouldn't the church still be keeping the law? Yeah, shouldn't the church the same way we love as black folks or Israelites here in America? When we love to say, America started off violent. America started off with slavery and killing and all of that. We love to say that, right? And then we love to say that's why it's still the way, it's still the way it is today. Then we got to say that about the original church. The original church started off keeping a law. The original church, not the whore that's out here now. Let's see what the original church started off with. Actually, to be honest with you, when you go to Acts 7, Stephen said the original church started in the wilderness. And the original church kept the law then. Now, when Jesus came in the flesh, told them to go and stay in Jerusalem, what did this church do? They still keeping the law. So now let's go to Leviticus 23 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. This ain't the feast of the Jews. It's not the feast of the Israelites. It's the feast of the Lord. The Lord said, This is my feast. Let's go to skip down to verse 4. These are the feast of the Lord, even holy convocations. Oh, so on the feast of the Lord, we're supposed to be getting together and having church, right? This is what the law say. This is what they did in Acts 2. Let's keep reading. Which ye shall proclaim in their seasons, not when you feel like it. You got to do this in their seasons. Now, today, because we went into slavery... We came out rediscovering this book again. Yeah, there are people that have different days. But I look at it as it's still in their seasons. You got some brothers, man, that'll start the new moon on the when it's black. You got some that start when it's the small cusp. Some do it when it's a full moon. And I, I don't really agree with that, but, you know, that's what they do. Some brothers, they start a month before everybody else or some starting a month behind everybody else. But the way I'm looking at it, it's still in its seasons. It's still in its seasons. That's why I don't go hard on everybody like I used to. It's still in its seasons and we all trying to keep the feast of the Lord and we done walked away from Christmas and all the rest of them pagan holidays. No camp banging. Let's get to verse, verse 9. Now, we know that these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in this season. Skip, let's go to verse 9 and read about the day of Pentecost. Verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give you, and ye shall reap the harvest thereof. Then ye shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And ye shall wave the sheaf before the Lord and accept, and accept it for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day with a <clears throat> when ye wave the sheaf of the lamb without blemish the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof, ye shall be two ten deals deals of fine flour mingled with oil and offered made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. 
and a drink offering therefore shall be of wine and fourth part of hen. And ye shall eat ye shall neither eat bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Notice where he said this shall be a statute forever throughout all your generations. But people want to say that the law is done away with. So you, you so so I guess God is lying right here. Let's keep reading. And ye shall count unto after the morrow of the Sabbath from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath ye shall number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. So on the fiftieth day after the seven Sabbaths. And you add another day, that seven Sabbaths times seven weeks is 49 days. All right, well, I might have said that wrong. Seven weeks, well, you can, seven, seven, seven weeks, we well, equal 49 days. Plus the one day it said to add, that's 50 days. And that's all Pentecost means in Greek is 50. That's it. Pentecost isn't a holy word. We got denominations that call themselves Pentecostal. Do they do this? Do they keep the day of Pentecost? And if they do, they're keeping the law. But you, but then they turn around and say you can't keep the law no more? There's confusion. I'm sorry, there's confusion right there. How are you going to be Pentecostal and say that we don't have to keep the law anymore? That doesn't make sense. Skip down to verse 21. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be an holy convocation unto you. See, we're supposed to get together on that day. That's what they were doing in Acts 2. Getting together on the Feast of Weeks. That's what it's called. We're going to read it. You shall do no servile work therein. You shall do no servile work. That means you can't go to your job and work for somebody else. And also, you can't go and force somebody else to work. So if the store is open and you go in there, to, you can't do that either, according to the book, because you're helping someone else work. They're not supposed to be working. Are we going to take the, uh, the, the um, are we going to take the idea or the mindset of our twin brother? You know, because that's what our twin brother does. Esau. They don't, most of them don't work on the Sabbath, but they got their stores open and they're making sure that their employees is there working. But that's against the law. Because in Exodus 20, the Lord said, your maidservant and your manservant should not be working either. So even here, you shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever. In all your dwellings throughout your generations, anywhere you go on this planet, when these days come up, you're not supposed to be working and you can't go out and sell or, or buy anything because they're not supposed to be working either. You're contributing to someone else breaking the law. Make your phone calls. Let's go to Exodus 34. This is the Feast of Weeks. That we're talking about. Exodus 34. And this is what they were doing in Jerusalem. In Acts 2. And a lot of people don't know that. They just think oh the church started there. No. The church started in the wilderness. Acts 34. And we're going to read two verses. 23. I mean 22 and 23. Oops, sorry wrong page. 22. 23, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks. That's what it's called. And the first fruits of wheat harvest and, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Feast of ingathering is tabernacles. 
So the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest, that's what we now call Pentecost. That's what we read in, in Acts 2. But that's when the church, that's what people say the church started, right? So the church started off keeping the law. But it was called the Feast of Weeks. Let's go to Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16, verse 8. Deuteronomy 16, verse 8. Six days shall thou eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly. To the Lord thy God thou shalt do no work therein. So this is talking about unleavened bread, right? Because there's things that we had that we could not do during the unleavened bread and Pentecost. And all God's feast days. Let's keep reading. Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. <coughs> and thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with the tribute of free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God according to the Lord. Thy God hath blessed thee. So when you come to the Feast of Weeks, or any other feast, you can't come empty-handed. Got to have something. All right? Money. These days, it's, it's money. Some people like to come bring wine with them for the Lord's Feast. Some people bring food. All of this stuff is to, you're supposed to bring something. All right? But the point I'm making is, we're looking at what the Feast of Weeks is. Pentecost is originally called the Feast of Weeks. We just read you got to number seven weeks and then add a day to make 50. And that's what Pentecost is in, in the Greek. 50. Or 50 days, one of the two. So they were keeping the law by... Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted. So in the keeping the law, when the Lord told them to, to go into and wait for the Holy Spirit, but he didn't tell them what day it just, it came on that day on a high day. All right, let's go to Acts 20. But these were the original Christians. And we're going to read about that too. Let's go to Acts 20. Because these, these, these questions I've always had for people that say that the law is no more. If the law is no more, why are these people after Christ died still keeping it? Read this book for yourself, people. Acts 20. Acts 20, we're going to start at verse 6. Now, this is Paul now. This is beloved Paul. To get out, he was going out here doing the, the Lord's work. Let's see what happened. Acts 20, verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. So, here's one question. If the law is over with, why did Paul keep unleavened bread? Why in the world would this dude write letters to people saying we don't have to keep these laws anymore because we're under grace? But yet he's still keeping it. That don't sound right to me. That sound like something a false prophet would do the other way around. You understand what I'm saying? That but that that don't that don't make sense to me. And Paul's not a liar. He's the one that did the law. He kept the law. And we're gonna read some things that he said too. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and it came to them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, I added this in because it needs to be done. All right. The first day of the week. Now, if you guys saw my last lesson about three days plus three nights equals Easter, you will see on the chart where Saturday night is where 
the first day of the week starts. Saturday night after sundown is when the first day of the week starts. So now that we know that, let's see what happened here. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, they came together to eat. All right. But this is Saturday night. This is after the Sabbath is over with, and it's Saturday night. Paul preached unto them. Now, he kept talking about the word of God. At my class, that happens in the wintertime when the sun goes down at like 4.30, 5 o'clock. There's still people there, and we talk about the word of God. We talk about the word of God any day of the week, right? That's what he was doing. He preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So after sundown, Saturday night, Paul was teaching until midnight on the first day of the week. But that does not mean now we got to worship on the first day of the week, not the Sabbath. So quit trying to twist that verse, my brothers and sisters. Let's go to verse 13. And went and we went in before to ship and sailed to Assos there intending to take in Paul. For so he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene, ah, I guess. And we sent, we sailed thence and came to the next day over against Shields or Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and the tarried and tarried at Trolegium. And the next day we sailed to meet Meatletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend any time in Asia for he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost, the day of the Feast of Weeks. Paul was he was meeting people and teaching. But when he realized, look, I'm behind in my schedule, he sailed by Ephesus, because he didn't want to spend time in Asia, because if it was possible for him to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, why is Paul doing that? If you say that the law is no more, Paul, why are you trying to keep the law and be at Pentecost, at Feast of Weeks? Maybe because Paul's not kicking against the law. Maybe it's other people that's kicking against the law and they want to cherry pick certain certain verses to say that the law is no more or they just don't have understanding. Maybe that's what it is. Because it doesn't make sense. And you can't say, well, that was just the law for the Jews. Or that was just the law for Israel. Jesus told these guys, go out and teach all nations. So it wasn't just for Israel. So Paul's not telling people, you don't have to do what we do. If you really want to understand Paul's letters, you got to read the whole book of Acts first. Seriously. Read the entire book of Acts and you will understand what Paul was doing. He was writing letters to the people he already taught. And remember, these letters are actually answers. So there are letters that he got and he's writing letters back to them. That's what we have. We don't have the letters that were the questions or the problems that they were having. But they understood him. Peter even said, Hey, if you ain't learned, you're not going, you know, if you unlearned, you ain't going to understand Paul's letters. And that's the problem the world got today. And Satan took advantage of that. Let's skip back a chapter to verse eight, uh, Acts 18. Now we read Paul was trying to make sure he got to the, to the uh, Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, right? <coughs> Acts 18, let's start at verse 18. Acts 18, verse 18. And Paul, after this tarried yet a good while, 
Then he took his leave of his brethren and sailed thence to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. He shaved his head. Hold on, y'all. Don't people like to say you ain't supposed to shave your head? Well, hey, Brother Paul did. Okay? Let's keep, let's keep reading. For he had a vow. He came to Ephesus and left there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer with a longer time with them, he consented not. So wait a minute. Paul went into the synagogue and he tarried with the Jews. He was reading to them. We're going to read that. We're going to back up a couple verses in this same chapter in a minute. But they didn't want him to leave. Why didn't they want him to leave? Because that spirit was on them. Verse 21. But bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh to Jerusalem. But I will return unto you again, if God will, and we and he sailed from Ephesus. He was trying to make sure. Let's go back to verse 1. He was trying to make sure that he was at the feast that was coming to Jerusalem. That does not make sense if Paul's saying you don't have to keep none of these laws. Because he's he's like, hey, I can't stay. I know y'all want me to stay. I, I want to stay. You know, and build with y'all some more. But I got to keep this feast. Let's go back to verse 1. Same chapter, Acts 18. After these things departed, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came into Corinth. Let's skip down to verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath that persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. On the Sabbath. Not on the first day of the week. This is on the Sabbath. Now don't get me wrong. You can teach, you can do whatever you want every day of the week, but you best keep that Sabbath. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. This is what Paul did. He was going around showing everybody, not only we still, we, you know, we, we keeping the law, but there were some things we didn't have to keep no more, but he was testifying about Christ and didn't break the laws. Let's get back another couple of chapters. Let's go back to uh, Acts 11. I started forward because I wanted to show everybody what Paul was doing Later on in Acts, and we're going to work our way back. Acts 11, verse 9. Because this is what he was doing before that. He was keeping the law. Acts 11, verse 19. I'm sorry. Now, when they were scattered abroad, the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. So yes, they this time they were preaching only to the Israelites. Because everything starts at home. That's why when Jesus came, he taught 12 more Israelites. He was getting rid of his priests that was that was hypocrites and starting 12 new. And they had to go out and preach unto their own First, verse 20, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they would come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. They talking about Jesus because this is what a Christian is. They follow Christ. We're going to get to that in a second. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. Where did it say the church was again? In Jerusalem. Did it say anything about the church in Rome? This is way past Acts 2 now. Because that's what the church in Rome liked to say. We started in Acts 2. No. This is the church that was in Jerusalem in Acts 2. 
Let's keep reading. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Who, when he came, had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with the purpose of the heart they should cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tars Tarsus for to seek Saul or to seek Paul. And when he had found him, he, sit, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church. They stayed for a year and they assembled themselves with the church. The original church that started in the wilderness and then in Acts 2 got the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Didn't we start reading at verse 19 and 20 that these were only Israelites? So who were the original Christians? Israelites who followed Christ. And y'all gonna hear Hebrews try to knock the word Christian. Oh man, that was a derogatory word they were calling us. So what? Y'all call each other niggas still. Y'all ain't got a problem with calling each other that. But boy, when it comes to the word Christ, shin. Oh, man, you, uh, you can't be calling me. Come on, bro. Let me not mention what the females call each other. My daughter, why are you over there giggling? I'm not even going to mention what the females call each other. Girl, they don't even say girl. It's the B word. It's cool to call yourself that, but don't call me a Christian. Come on, man. <laughs> Verse 27, and these days came prophets from Jerusalem to Antioch. So the original Christians who were Israelites were in Antioch and the prophets that were in Jerusalem started coming to Antioch. All these people followed Christ. And Christ said, keep the law. Paul never broke the law. Come on. Read this book, man. Read this book. Let's go. Now let's skip up to, to Acts 26. So now we see what was going on in the beginning. That the original, oh, I'm sorry. That the original Christians were not just black, but they were Israelites. The original Christians. We ain't talking about Christianity of today. The original Christians, the original church. Not the one that got hijacked. Acts 26 verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul. Paul is on trial. All right. And he's going to be talking to King Agrippa. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. You can read the whole chapter on your own. But we're going to skip down to verse 12. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority, the commission from the chief, commission from the chief priest. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. Above the brightness of the sun, shining around, I'm, I'm sh shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen into the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying, In the Hebrew tongue, not in the Greek. You know, there's people that like to say Paul was not an Israelite, but the book tells you straight out. He was not only Israel, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He knew his stock. So we got Paul being told something in the Hebrew tongue. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? I said, and I said, who art thou, Lord? 
And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen. And of those things in which, I'm sorry, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles. Wait a minute, from the people, his own people. Because then he says, and the Gentiles, and from the Gentiles. Let's keep going. Unto whom now I send thee. Wait a minute. Christ told them not to go no place else but unto Israel, right? But now he's telling Paul, I'm sending you not just to the people, but to the Gentiles. Now it's time to take this around the world. To open their eyes. And to turn them into and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. What? Christ is telling Paul to go teach the Gentiles, my Hebrew brothers and sisters, so they can be saved as well. Let's keep on reading. And inheritance. Oh. Inheritance is two. And inheritance amongst them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul's job is to now go out here and teach these Gentiles the same thing he was teaching Israel. And remember, the original Christians were uh, uh, Israel. So when the other Gentiles started following the original Christians, what did they become? Christians that kept the laws of God. Verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed the first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all of the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should re repent and turn unto God and do Works meet for repentance. Now, Paul is going out teaching the Gentiles the same thing Peter said, the same thing Christ said. Repent. It's all about repenting. But here's the thing. What are you repenting from? Sinning. What is sinning? The transgression of the law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Verse 21, for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me because they was like, dude, what you teaching them white folks for? Don't we still got that today? Ain't nothing new under the sun. We got these same Hebrews out here doing this now. Well, you out there teaching them the Esau, he the devil. 22, having therefore obtained the help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small, both small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. He preached everything from Moses and the prophets. There was no gospel for Paul. There was no gospels for Paul to read. He's teaching everybody about Christ. White and black. Out of the Moses and the prophets. How can you say that the law is over with? And Paul being a Christian. Was teaching out of the Old Testament. 23. That Christ should suffer that he should be the first. That should rise from the dead. And should show light unto the people. And to the Gentiles. This wasn't about just showing light to Israel. Israel was supposed to be the light to the world. That's why Christ came again. It was more than just dying. He had to reteach and make sure that Israel could be a light unto the world. But what did it say? Show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, 
Ephesians, oh, yeah, let's keep reading. Said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. That same thing going on today, people. You out your mind out there teaching the rest of these heathens. That's what was told. That's what we're supposed to do. That's Israel's job. Whoever got an ear and want to listen, you teach them. 25, but he said, I am not mad, most noble fetus, but I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? What? He asking him, King Agrippa, you believe the prophets, right? Okay, let's keep reading. I know that thou believest. King Agrippa been ear hustling. He, or he got somebody that been showing him some stuff. Because King Agrippa ain't an Israelite. Then King Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuaded me to be a, a Christian. Whoa, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, I know I said King Agrippa was a Gentile before, but I got corrected by my brothers. He was an Edomite. But he said to this black Christian Israelite, hashtag, Thou almost persuaded me to be a Christian. The original Christians were Israelites. And Paul's job was to go out and bring in more Christians from the other nations. That's what his job was. Let's read 28 one more time. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, Almost thou persuaded. Pers persuades me to be a Christian because what did Paul say earlier King Agrippa you believe the prophets he believed the prophets this king believed in the prophets but now Paul is using Moses and the prophets to preach Christ and what did he say I almost persuaded me to be one of y'all a Christian makes no sense the Christians, the early Christians were Israelites and then the rest of the Gentiles were coming into the commonwealth of Israel. Let's go to Acts 17. So why was Paul doing all that stuff? He was a Christian. But today's Christians say, oh, we ain't got to keep the laws no more. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're a sun worshiper and you need to become a Christian. Same thing from a Hebrew brothers. Maybe you're following the commandments of God and you need to become a Christian. Now, you don't want to call yourself Christian. Most people, brothers, call themselves messianics. It's the same thing. There's no shame in the word, man. Quit being so mad and angry at your oppressors that any word they bring up, you want to know. If that's the case, stop reading the Bible. Get you an all Hebrew Bible and learn to teach from there and only speak it. The Lord said in Isaiah 28, where we read the beginning of this lesson, He's going to speak to everybody in all languages. What is it? Uh, well, I ain't going to get it. I, 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 I start messing myself up. Let's get back into this lesson. Acts 17. So, again, if the law is done away with. Why are Christians doing what we're about to read now? Acts 17, verse 1. And when they had passed through Amphilippus and Apollonia, they came into Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And as Paul, as his manner was, went unto them in three Sabbaths, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Paul's a Christian. because He's following Christ. First of all, why is he going in the Sabbath uh, in the synagogue on the Sabbath day? Because that's what the original Christians did. And he persuaded what he re reasoned with them out of the scriptures. What are the scriptures? 
Genesis to Malachi. There was no New Testament yet. What was he teaching them out of Genesis to Malachi? Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. So Paul kept teaching everybody about Christ just from the Old Testament. But New Testament politicians want to tell you you don't have to read the Old Testament. We just going to stay over here with Paul's writings. But Paul was testifying of the Old Testament. Following Christ. Skip down to verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him that he should. And he, when he saw the whole city given into idolatry. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's go to Acts 20. Why is Paul upset? If the, if the whole city is given into idolatry. Why is Paul upset? That doesn't make sense, does it? If the law is no more, if the law is done away with, there should be no reason why Paul is getting upset because everybody is giving in to idolatry. Let's read why Paul was upset when he saw everybody giving in to idolatry. Let's go to Exodus 20. We're going to start reading verse 4. Thou should not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Nor serve them. For I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children. Unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy. Unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. This is why Paul was upset. He didn't talk this place. I come back and now, what is all these, what's all these statues and all of this other stuff that's going on? If anybody, well, you got to go on my YouTube in order to see it. I got a thing called, uh, I can't remember the title, but I went into a church. I went into a, um, a, a, a Catholic church one time filming and man, it was just idols all over the place. That should show you that that church is not following Christ or the commandments. That's what that should show. You walk in, you see statues everywhere. There was even, I, oh, I can't remember the name of that. I can't remember the name of that lesson, but it's on my YouTube. And it's an old lesson. It's not even a lesson. I just went in there filming and showing everybody. This is what God said not to do. Let's go to Acts 13. He was upset because they were breaking the law with all this idolatry. And it did not make sense. It didn't make sense. Let's go to Acts 13. I'm really concentrating a lot on what Paul was doing because a lot of people like to use Paul to say that we can't use, we don't have to keep the law no more. So Paul's upset because there's idolatry going on. All right. Let's go to Acts 13 and read something else that Paul did. Let's go to Acts 13. Start reading to verse 13. Acts 13 and 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphros, they came into per Persia and Pamphylia and John departing from them returning to Jerusalem. And when they departed from Persia, they came to Antioch and Persidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Here we go again. If the law is no more, why are, they, why are they keeping the Sabbath day law, the fourth commandment? Verse 15, after the reading of the law and the prophets, you know what, man? You know what, man? What, what time is it? I don't really think I need to go anymore. What time is it? And 12. Well, we might go over because this, this don't make sense. They say Paul said that the laws are over with. The, the, the church, the whore church, has even taken out the Sabbath day. But if they're going to use Paul, why was Paul 
reading the law and the prophets on the Sabbath day. That don't make sense. Skip down to verse 42. Let's see what else Paul did when in this same chapter. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles, now this is when Paul was teaching, right? This is what happened after he taught on a Sabbath day. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles, the white folks, besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. Now, if you think that the white folks or the Gentiles of the Christianity back then did everything on Sunday, you're mistakenly wrong. These cats came on the Sabbath day and they wanted Paul to teach to them the next Sabbath day. They could have easily said, hey, we have church on Sunday. Won't you come and teach us? Let's keep going. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day come almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. So the whole city, this is, this is Israel and Gentiles. They all came the next Sabbath day. They didn't come on Sunday or the first day of the week. Verse 45, but the Jews saw the multitudes. They were filled with envy. So Israel saw Paul. Teaching not just the, the well, Israelites, but he was teaching white folks too. And they got jealous and they were filled with envy. And Israel do it to this very day. They will see another brother that is sitting up here doing the work of God and people responding to him and they will talk crap behind his back to other people. You should be joyful that another brother or sister is bringing in people to <laughs> the wedding. But your carnal mind is saying, I can't stand that person. And you don't even have a legit reason to not stand that person. This is what Paul went through with his own brothers. But we're going to keep reading. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Oh, so now they're breaking the law because they hated Paul that much. That's that's ridiculous. You're willing to put your eternal life on the line because you're jealous of another brother. Wow. Verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should have been spoken to you. Because they were Israelites. He was telling them it was necessary for us to come and teach you first. But we also got to deal with these Gentiles. But because you tripping, let's keep reading. But seeing that ye put it from you, ye judge yourselves, unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn into the Gentiles. They weren't even worthy of everlasting life. That means they broke the law. They were contradicting and blaspheming everything he said, right? And the Lord's sitting right there watching this crap. Mm -hmm. Verse 47, So, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that they should be salvation unto the ends of the earth. That's in Isaiah. Isaiah 49 and 6. That's where that is. That's not in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. Verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. When these white folks heard that they had a shot of everlasting life, they were happy and glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many were ordained into eternal life, believed. This is what Paul was doing. 
the original Christians were doing these things. So again, if the law is done away with, why are the original Christians doing this? That's the food for thought question you need to have in your mind. Why were they doing these things? And no, you cannot use the excuse because that's only for the Jews. We have another law. Show me that law. Show me in the book, not other people books. Show me in this book right here where God said, I got a law for Israel, but Gentiles, I got another law for you. I'll take you right back to the Old Testament where he said, where, where the Lord said, same law for the stranger, that's for the uh, law for the homeborn. God is not a respecter of persons. You want to become, you want everlasting life, you got to become a, a part of the commonwealth of Israel. According to the scriptures. And why was Paul doing all of this stuff? Let me show you why Paul was doing all this stuff. When he got put on trial again. Let's go to Acts 24 and verse 14. He got put on trial again. And listen to what Paul said. Acts 24 verse 14. But this I confess unto thee. That after the way which they call heresy, we are we just we just read where he was teaching the word and they lied and blasphemed against him and contradicted him. So what is he saying? But I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things. Believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. Okay, so everything in Genesis to Malachi, Paul believed it. Already shown you. He taught it all the time. He taught Christ out of there. He taught Christ so much. Let's go, let, let's go to St. John real quick. St. John 5. He taught Christ so much that Christ even said it. St. John 5. And remember, Christ didn't, I mean, Paul didn't read these gospels. But what did, but Paul knew that law. And he, when he got the, when the Lord opened up his understanding, when he knocked him on his behind and blinded him, he opened up his mind to who he was. He was telling him, look, you know the law. That's me. St. John 5, verse 46. So Paul believed everything from Moses and, and the prophets, right? St. John 5, 46. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, ye shall, uh, how shall ye believe my words? How are you going to believe my words? Moses wrote of me. So if you don't believe me and you claim that you, you know, and this is the Hebrews. If you claim that you love God and you're going to keep his commandments, then you should know who I am. But that's, that's, that wasn't the issue, was it? I'm trying to find another spot. I can't remember. I didn't write it down in here. Uh, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, let's keep on moving. But Paul believed in the law and the prophets, right? Moses and the prophets. Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. And Jesus kept it. Let's go back to Acts 28. Acts 28. I'm, if you notice in this lesson, I'm using a lot of spots in Acts because I want people to look at Acts and read it all. And understand nowhere in here where it was told to get rid of the law. None. Acts 28 verse 22. But we desire to hear now. This is when Paul was, uh, I think he was in Rome. But he was getting ready to leave again. Let's read 22. But when we desire to hear of thee, that I think, oh, I'm sorry, I need this. For we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, 
We know that everywhere it is spoken against us. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him unto his lodging, to whom he expounded the testif and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, out of the Old Testament, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. This is Paul again. He didn't come up with his own doctrine. Paul and these original people that followed Christ were the original Christians. And the Gentiles that came in and did exactly what they were taught by Paul and the rest of them, the other disciples, they were all considered Christians. So if the law is done away with, why are the Christians doing these things? Why are they doing these things? If the law is done away with, let's go to Leviticus 27. If the law is done away with, I have another question. Because Christians still do this today. They did it then, but they're still doing it today. And my question is why? Why are you doing this here? If the law is, if all the law is gone, Leviticus 27, we're going to start reading at verse 30. Leviticus 27 and verse 30. And all the tithe of the land. Let me get my cup ready. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. And it, it is holy unto the Lord. Why are you giving tithes? If your pastor, and this is a challenge that I would like for people who go to only Sunday churches who teach that the law is no more. This is one of the biggest tests right here. If the law is no more in the law, it's talking about tithing. Ask your pastor first, is the law done away with? Yeah, we ain't got to keep none of those old laws. Oh, so I don't have to give you tithes no more. Hold on a second. Now they're going to try to switch stuff around. Why are you giving tithes? If you call yourself a Christian and you dealing with Sunday doctrine Christianity, you don't have to give tithes no more. But the law says you got to give a tithe. And what is the tithe? One tenth of your earnings. That's what the Lord said to do. And they're going to somehow try to twist it. But again, if they're saying the law, you can't go back in the old law and say, well, this is good and this is good. No, because everybody going to say that the money is good, especially when they get in the money. And no, this ain't just talking about you. The only tithe you're supposed to bring is is a can of uh, tomatoes or whatever. No, you can bind it up into the money. I wish I had put that in here, but you can bind that all up into the money if your journey is long, far away. So money is also tithing. But ask your pastor. Ask him first. Is the law? We don't have to keep the law no more, right? Yeah. All right. So I'm not paying tithes no more. Let's see what your answer be. See what your answer is. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22. Let's see how much time I got left. Old man got put glasses on so he can see the time over there. Okay, I think I handle it. Deuteronomy 22. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22. Again, if the law is no more, we just read where the Christians did a, a bunch of stuff that was pertaining to the law, especially Paul, right? Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. Let's read something that's in the law now, but if the law is no more, nobody should be getting convicted over it. Verse 22. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die. 
both of the man shall lay with the woman that lay with the woman and with the woman and the woman so shall thou put away evil from Israel if a damsel this is where I really want to start if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed to a husband and a man find her in the city and lie with her then ye shall bring them both out of the gate of that city and ye shall stone them with stones that they die the damsel because she cried not being in the city and the man because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife so that thou shall put away evil from among you this is killing people full of adultery and remember where it says she cried not let's keep reading but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and a man force her and lie with her then the man that lay with her shall die but unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing there there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death for as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him even so is the matter for he found her in the field and betrothed the dam oh for he found her in the field and betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her. So if you're in the city, either way it go, if you're being raped, you're supposed to cry out, right? But if you don't cry out, that's not rape. You want this. Unless a dude goes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you still got to cry out. Because then, if you didn't, oh, you wanted this to happen. If you cry out in the field and nobody can hear you because it's out far in the field, when they find out that man did it, the man dies either way it go. Right? But if you say the laws no more, why are people being convicted for rape? Why are they getting convicted for rape? Because the law still exists. That's why. Let's keep on reading. No, no, that's that's all we reading it at. Okay, let's go to um, let's go to Leviticus eighteen. Let's go to Leviticus eighteen. You say the law is no more. Nobody should be convicted for adultery. No, nobody, nobody should be convicted for rape. That's why you gotta watch what you say. Just because some false prophet has put it in your mind, you better read this book and make sure because. Every idle word is going to be judged coming out of your mouth. And if you're telling people we don't have to keep the law no more, you're telling people, hey, we don't have to keep the commandments of God. You in trouble with that hair fire. You in trouble. Leviticus 18. What time is it? 930 yet? Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm going to try to read through this quick. Because we're getting this whole chapter down. Leviticus 18. Let's understand what this whole chapter is about. It's about incest. Let's start at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and saying to them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, where ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, where I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. All the stuff we're about to read is what Israel learned in Egypt, and what and they were and the Egyptians were Hamites, and their brother the Canaanites were doing the same thing. Verse four: Ye shall do no ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein, and I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes. And my judgments, which if any man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Now, <clears throat> if the law is no more, everything we're about to read should be legit to this very day. See, that's what this is why it's not cool to say that the law is no more, and you ain't never really read the law. Because you could be condemning yourself. Let's start at verse 6. 
None of you shall approach any that is near kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. All this is about incest. And there's going to be some extra stuff too. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother, thou shalt not uncover. She is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness, uh, uh, so if you can't get down with your mama, brothers. The nakedness of thy father's wife shall not thou uncover. It, it is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, thou should, uh, uh, the daughter of thy father or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness, Thou shalt not uncover. You can't get down with your brother or your sister. This is in the law. This is why you got to be careful when you're talking about the laws no more. So when these things start happening, you can't be like, man, that's wrong. No, you said the law was no more. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. The nakedness of thy son's daughter or thy daughter's daughter in their nakedness, even their nakedness, thou shalt not uncover. For theirs is thine own nakedness. So these, if it's your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, this is your grandchildren. You can't get down with your grandchildren. This is in the law. Let's skip down to verse 12. And then let's read 11. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thy father's wife's daughter. What would that be? Your father's wife's daughter. That's still your sister. You can't get down with your sister. You can't get down with your brother. Verse nine. Uh, verse 12. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. For she is thy near kin's woman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. That is your auntie. You can't get down with your auntie. Aunties, you done watch that boy grow up. Oh, he a big strong man. You can't get down with him. That's in the law. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach unto his wife. She is thine aunt. You can't get down with your uncle's wife either. The Lord tighten this up. They trying to cut me off, y'all. <laughs> let's keep, let's see, see how much we can get in. Thou shalt not uncover the net, verse 15. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. So, brothers, if your son wife try to holler at you you can't get down with your son's wife that's the law that's your daughter-in-law thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife it is thy brother's nakedness brothers if you have a brother and he is still living you can't get down with his wife I know about the law. If your brother dies, you're supposed to raise up seed unto that woman. But the Lord said, if he dies, Israel didn't do, the Israel was doing these things, but the Lord is telling them, uh-uh. You can't get down with your, with your sister-in-law. Same thing, sisters. You can't get down with your brother-in-law. Verse 17, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of the woman and her daughter, neither shall thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover the nakedness, for they are her near kin's women. It is wickedness. This is your if you get if you get with a woman and her daughter. It's right, Sister Cantu. It's an abomination. It's abomination. This is what the Lord is saying. Neither shall thou take a wife to vex her sister, to vex her or uncover her nakedness besides the other in her lifetime. Also, thou shalt not approach. Oh, yeah, let me get to that. Even though the Lord allowed us a certain 
people. Because the only one I can really read is when it comes to Jacob. Because he was tricked. He wanted one girl, but he ended up having to marry the older sister. And then he, But the Lord is saying, here, you can't marry two sisters. Because it's going to vex one of the sisters. So for any of you Hebrews that believe in polygamy, you can't go up to two sisters and say, I want to marry both of y'all. So sisters, if you're into polygamy, remember that. The Lord is saying you can't, he cannot marry you and your sister. Verse 19, also that, also thou should not approach into the woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she be put apart and for uncleanliness. So if the law is over with, I guess having sex when a woman is on her menstrual is okay. No, it's in the law. The Lord said not to do that. Verse, and it's nasty. Twenty, Verse 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to divide, thou, divide thyself with her. That's in the Ten Commandments. That's adultery. This is all in the law, but people like to say the law is done away with. Christ nailed it all to the cross. Then all of this should be legit now. But it's not. Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire of Molech, neither shall thou profane the name of the Lord, name of, of thy God. I am the Lord. How do you prof how do you let your seed pass through the fire of Molech? Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, a whole bunch of holidays. You're teaching Easter. I just got done doing Easter. You're teaching your children to serve another God. God threw this in here in the midst of all of this. You're teaching them the Easter egg hunts. You, all of that stuff. You're giving your kids over to Molech. But nobody's teaching you this stuff. They're just telling you, oh, Jesus, this, Jesus, Jesus. Nothing wrong with that. But Jesus said, keep the law if you want an et eternal life. Oh, let's get to the biggest one of all right now. Let's get to the biggest one of all right now. Verse 22. Thou shalt not lie. I might get cut off for this. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. The Lord said homosexuality is wrong. This ain't my opinion. This is what the book says. And the book is saying what God is saying. He said again, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. You cannot lie with a man like she, like he's a woman. That is homosexuality. You can't get out of that. That's what thus saith the Lord. Let's take it a step further. Verse 23. Neither shall thou lie with any beast to defile thyself wherewith, therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down unto. It is confusion. The Lord made sure that sisters don't try to take this verse and say, I see that's just for the brothers. You can't lie. And have sex with animals. But those that say that the law is no more. Shouldn't get upset at those that do. This is why you got to understand what the law is. Before you make that statement people. Verse 24. Defile not yourselves with any of these things. For in all these things the nations are defiled. Which I cast before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomited out the inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither of your own nation nor any stranger that journeys uh, among you, so journeth among you. So the same thing applies. To the Gentiles and the rest of the world, the same law is also when it comes to Israel. 
This is one thing, one family the Lord is trying to put together. And whoever going to be a, a, a part of it got to keep his laws, commandments, and statutes. For Verse 27, for all these abominations have the men of the land done, which are before you, and the land is defiled. And the land spew, oh, that the land spew not you out also, when ye defile it, and it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. We're not in the land anymore, are we? It spewed us out, right? So guess what our ancestors kept doing? Everything we just read. The Lord said, don't do these things because I'm taking these people out of this land. The land going to spew them out because of these things. And we got spewed out. What does that tell you? We did it too. That's why we in other, other nations. Verse 29 and 30. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore ye shall keep mine ordinance that ye shall not commit, any, commit not shall not commit not any one of these abomination abominable customs which were committed before you and that ye defile not yourselves therein I am the Lord your God and we teach this today people have y'all really closely listened to hip hop and rap and stuff there's some things in there that man they the kids is doing and Lord ain't happy with it. And they saying it right in the records now. They saying it right in the records. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4. So if the law is done away with, all that incest stuff that I just read should be legal. But it's not, is it? It's not. You, you can't stand if you heard anything like that going on. But why? Why would you feel that way if you say the law is done away with? Maybe because you know the law still exists. But you're trying to impress people. Or if you're a preacher, you're trying to keep that money. First Timothy. Got to understand, man. The Lord ain't playing. Jesus told us straight out. Let's read something else. That people like to use of Paul. But Paul wasn't saying what they think they say. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speak, speak, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's what the world is on today. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Those are politicians and everyone that likes to say the law's done away with. The original Christians didn't say the law was done away with. But we in these latter times, right? Let's see some of the stuff. Verse three, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. See, this is the part that people don't understand or want to continue reading. They like to just get to the part where it says, which God created and received, I'm sorry, forbidding to marry and commanding to stay abstain from meats, which God created to be received with thanksgiving. But they don't keep reading of them which believe and know the truth. What's the truth? The commandments of God, right? For every creature of God is good, no doubt. And nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Yes, all these unclean animals, I received them with thanksgiving, but I know the truth that I cannot eat them. If we didn't have unclean animals, this world would be the most foulest, stankiest place, period. If there's a dead deer in the woods and nobody know about it, it's, it's going to stink. And everybody will be like, what is that smell? 
But when there's a dead deer in the woods, all them little things, the possums, the raccoons, the, the, the coyotes over here, they going to have a feast and get rid of that body before it starts. I'm thankful for that. I wish they would do that with skunks like right away because many of y'all know when a skunk get hit by a car, man, the whole neighborhood is kicking. And them animals, some of them won't even go and eat the thing because it stinks so bad. But I wish that when they died, whatever that sack that's holding that smell just didn't smell. And then the animals go over there and eat it, you know. But that's what I'm thankful for, that those animals exist. Let's keep reading. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. How, what does sanctified mean? It means set apart. So if it's sanctified by the word of God, where's the word of God at? The Old Testament. And prayer. So you praying, Lord, I thank you for this food. But what food are you being thankful for? Let's go to Deuteronomy 14. You can't say that the law is, is no good and it's gone. Because you're not reading what Paul's saying. You're reading what you want to read. Because you want to continue to continue to read. I mean, uh, eat unclean animals. Deuteronomy 14. I might go over a little bit today, y'all. Deuteronomy 14. Let's start reading. The sanctification of animals by the word of God that are separate. For Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. For art thou holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself. Above all the nations that are upon the earth, thou shalt not eat any abominable, abominable thing. These are the beasts which ye shall eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the hart, the roebuck, and the fallow deer, and the wild goat, and the uh, pagarg, I don't know what that is, wait a minute, and the wild ox, and the, ch and the chamois, okay? Those are the things that the Lord said you can eat. Here's the separation, the sanctification of, uh, uh, of God by the word of God. The separate, and this is what the true believers believe because they know the truth. That's what we can eat. Skip down to verse 8 and see what we can't eat now. And the swine, the pig, pork. This ain't a Muslim thing. The Muslims got it from the word of God. They got it from Israel. And the swine, because it divided the hoof, Yet chew if not the cud. This is what we were talking about yesterday, right, daughter of mine? Right. So now, because it divideth the hoof, yet chew not the cud, it is unclean to you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. We're not supposed to eat pig, pork, swine, the other white meat, whatever they want to call it. All right. A lot of products have pork in it. Gelatin is the biggest thing. So when you're looking at your ingredients, make sure you ain't got gelatin. Now, if it's gelatin made from cows, I think it's a K gelatin. Somebody that know better than me, put it in the comments. But if it's straight gelatin, that's pork. What else can we eat? Verse 9. These ye shall eat of all that are in the waters. All that have fins and scales, ye shall eat. And whatsoever hath not fins and scales, ye may not eat. It is unclean unto you. Can't eat catfish. Can't eat all the seafood. We cannot eat. This is what God said. And it's in the word of God. And sanctified. It's separated. He just said in, in verse 9, you can eat every fish that has fins and scales. But in verse 10, he said, if it don't have fins and scales, you can't eat it. Lobster, shrimp, crab. 
When y'all making your gumbo. Woo. Mouse stew. Yes. People, we gonna read a little bit later a little bit later. But yeah, there's broths made of unclean animals. Which what amazes me is that people that eat pigs frown upon people who eat dogs. That don't sound right. Let's skip to, oh, let's get to the birds. Verse 11, of all the clean birds ye shall eat, but these are they which ye, sh ye shall not eat, the eagle and the offrage and the offspring. You can keep reading for yourself. Even the raven is down there and the owl, hawk, all these birds he said not to eat. This is the sanctification through the word of God for people that know the truth. They know that the Lord said, I can eat this and I cannot eat that. That's the Lord. Let's go to Isaiah 65. We're going to stay on the swine thing, though. We're going to stay on the swine thing. And I'm going to try to hurry this up. Isaiah 64. Because we just read what the Lord said, I told you not to eat the pig, right? Isaiah 65. Did I say 64? I'm sorry. 65, people, if I said 64. And what we're about to read is in the future. All right? We're going to read Isaiah 65, 2 and 5, and then Isaiah 66, 15 and 18. Let's go to Isaiah 65, 2. I-65, Isaiah 65, verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walk in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. He talking about Israel. I've spread out my hands continually to Israel and they keep doing what they want to do. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face. That sacrifice in the gardens and burneth incense upon the altars of brick. And to this very day, we still do the same thing. Lord, you said to do this, but I'm going to do what I want to do. That, that's what Israel does. That's what we do. Which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh. And the broth of abominable things is in their vessels. Which say, stand by thyself, come not near unto me, for I am holier than thou. These are smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Here's where the original holier than thou came from. And for those that have understanding, the holier than thou are the people who continue to break the law and say, you don't have to keep the law no more. If someone is trying to tell you and show you what the word is, they're not being holier than thou. The ones that don't want to keep the word are the ones that saying I'm holier than you. Israel need to get that through their head because they love to pull this, the same thing that the Sunday doctrine people do. Israel try to do it too. Somebody trying to show them some. Next thing you know, hey, that brother think he holier than thou. No, that ain't even it. If a brother love you, he trying to help save you through the word of God. But what did it say? Which eat swine's wet flesh, right? He said, these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. These people are eating abominable, abominable animals and the Lord hates it. Verse, let's go to Isaiah 66. Let's just skip on over to verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. This is in the future. The Lord has not come yet to do this. He did not come as the Lion of Judah yet. He came as the Lamb of God. So what we're reading is once the Lord comes back. I really hope people are listening to this verse, these verses. I'm going to start at 15 again. For behold, the Lord will come with fire 
and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. This is Christ. This is Jesus. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. He's not going to have his sword and fire talk about, please understand, please follow me. No, his pleading is, off with ye head. Off with ye head. Ye have no powers here. Off with ye head. He killing. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. This is when the Lord comes back. Let's read what some of these people did. They that sanctified themselves and purified themselves in the garden behind one tree in the mist. These are the people that followed Satan. There was two trees in the midst of the garden. One was Christ. The other one was Satan, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he's saying these people followed Satan. They stood behind him. And they were told they could do something when the Lord told them not to do it. What is it? Eating swine's flesh. Mm, mm, mm. I, 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 I. People, you don't want to be a part of this. This is one of the main things you need to stop doing. Eating this swine's flesh. Eating this pig. Everything is about obedience to the Lord. And if the Lord said, don't do this, don't do it. Yeah, it was, it's going to be hard trying to get off the swine and all that stuff. But if you value your eternal life, he said, back here in the Old Testament, you can't run to Paul in 1 Timothy and be like, see, we can do anything we want. He says, sanctified, which means separated by the word of God. The word of God is back here telling you. Can't eat swine. Then he's telling you in the future, when I come back, anyone who is eating swine is going to die. It's that simple. Eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse. There, hey, mouse soup. Yes, in America, we don't hear about this stuff, but there's a lot of people around the world that do stuff like this. Shall be consumed together. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. He coming as a gangster. That's what the Lord is saying. I'm coming back gangster on you. You seen movies of gangsters on you ain't seen nothing till I come back. And if you have not done what I told you to do, you going to die. That's, that's what the Lord is basically saying. But too many people are sitting up saying that the law is no more. And that's, that's blaspheming. You can't prove that. All you can do is go to, to, to Paul's writing and cherry pick some things and not have understanding. Again, Peter is the one that told us if you are unlearned you will not understand Paul's writings. That's why you got to go back and learn the laws. And then you understand Paul's writings. Let's go to 1 John 2. Three scriptures, we go. 1 John 2. 1 John, second chapter, one verse. Two verses. Verse 3. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Someone saying they know Christ or they know the father and they're teaching. You don't have to keep the command. They're a liar. That's what the books say. That's what the books say. That ain't what brother uh, as is saying. I say it, but I'm only repeating what the books say. And why? Because this is what's being repeated here. They are a liar. The truth is not in them. They can look good, have shiny suit, man, 
They can have all that stuff on. They can have the best car, the best cribs and all that, acting like they're blessed. But the truth is not in them. Let's go to St. John 3. Why isn't the truth in them? I'm sorry. Let's go to 1 John 3 and 4. Why isn't the truth in them? Let's go to 1 John 3 and 4 and read. This is why. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So, in order to sin, you got to break the law. But if they're telling you the law is no more, you're going to keep sinning. That's why ain't no truth in them. Pick the book up and read. Ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. Because your eternal life is on the line. One more verse. Verse Peter. Your life is on the line. You may not think it's on the line, but it is. That's how blind, that's how, this is how cold Satan is. The, the, the Lord told us in Genesis 3, in verse 1, that Satan was more subtle, which means more crafty than any beast of the field. We're beasts too. That's why he fooled, C, uh, I was about to say my daughter's name. <laughs> that's why he fooled Eve. Because he was smarter than her. But the Lord warned Adam and Eve, or Adam and Adam warned Eve, that the Lord said, don't talk to Satan. This dude talked one third of the angels to go against God. And they knew and saw God. That's how that's how bad that dude is. You can walk around all day talking about, I'm stomping on the devil's head and all of that stuff. Hey, Satan sitting right there like, yeah, yeah, okay, I got, I, I got you. 1 Peter 4, and we're going to start reading at verse 15. But let, now this is Peter talking. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Is that in the law? Oh. Or as a thief. Oh, is, is that in the law? Thou shalt not steal. And, and murder was thou shalt not kill. Yeah, okay. As an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, as a what? As a Christian, as a follower of Christ, the same way Paul was a follower of Christ, the same way all these guys were a follower of Christ, and they were the original Christians, and they kept the law. Yet if any man, not, it doesn't say, yet if an Israelite, it says, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. That's why y'all always see me hashtagging Christian Israelite. Because I'm trying to be, and I'm saying trying, to be a follower of Christ first, before my nationality. That's why I always put up hashtag Christian Israelite. Because two thirds of Israelites ain't going to get into the kingdom either. Just because you an Israelite does not mean you're going to get in. You better be a follower of Christ and keep that law. One more time, verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his on this behalf. That's what we're supposed to do. As Christians. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Glorifying God, teaching the rest of the world including the Gentiles and the Hamites, Edomites too. Keep the commandments of God and follow Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing because that's what the original Christians did. And the original Christians were Israelites. So ask yourself this question. If the law is done away with, why did the original Christians do the things that I showed you in this video? All right.
So I thank y'all for watching. All glory to the Father in the mighty name of Jesus. Please share, like the video. Please um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. As a K Fingers to the The Wake Up Show. Because I, I, I still need some more people. <laughs> in order for me to go live on there again. Alright. But most important. Just share this video. Especially with family members. Who ain't listening to you. Alright. Peace and Jesus. Wake up, 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 wake up